Good evening, everyone. Welcome to NTD Tonight. I'm David Zhang. Here are today's top stories. A win for the Biden administration. The Supreme Court ruled that the federal government cannot be sued by states for working with social media companies. Changes to Title IX that include gender identity with sex-based discrimination go into effect August 1st. In Washington, D.C., a group including former swimmer Riley Gaines and tennis star Martina Navratilova spoke in strong opposition to the updates. Voters from New York to Colorado to South Carolina took to the polls to cast their votes. We'll recap highlights from yesterday's House primaries. First up, the U.S. Supreme Court has declined to remove certain limits on the Biden administration and the way it communicates with social media platforms. The Supreme Court ruled that the government cannot be sued for working with the social media companies. The case was brought against the Biden administration by the states of Missouri and Louisiana and five individuals. Republican-led states argue that the federal government shouldn't have pressured social media to censor topics including COVID-19 and election security. But the Supreme Court just ruled the 6-3 to three that they had no standing to sue. It declined to impose limits on the way President Biden's administration may communicate with the social media platforms. This overturned a lower court's decision that various federal officials likely violated the U.S. Constitution's First Amendment. A top Democratic lawyer is trying to keep Robert F. Kennedy Jr. off New Jersey's ballot this November. Scott Salmon says Kennedy broke the state's so-called sore loser law. The law stops candidates from running as independents after losing a major party nomination. Kennedy initially ran for president as a Democrat until October 2023. Salmon has challenged other candidates before, including Kanye West, in 2020. He says Kennedy's actions violate the law and wants him barred from the ballot. Kennedy's team hasn't commented yet. Political experts are watching closely to see the impact of Kennedy's independent run. WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange landed to a warm welcome in Australia after pleading guilty to violating U.S. espionage law. Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is thanking the U.S. and U.K. for releasing Assange. Uh, Mr. Assange and I, uh, this evening, as I said, I've, I've never met Mr. Assange. Um, uh, I... Uh, had a very warm discussion with him this evening, though. Uh, he was uh, very generous uh, in his praise uh, of the Australian government's efforts. Uh, the Australian government stands up for Australian citizens. That's what we do. Thanks very much. The WikiLeaks founder arrived in Canberra earlier today on a charter flight. Assange raised his right fist as he emerged from the plane and his supporters at the airport cheered from a distance. Assange's lawyer said the legal team is delighted at his return to freedom. He said Assange was criminalized for journalism and the prosecution sets a dangerous precedent. Assange pleaded guilty to violating U.S. espionage law in connection to obtaining and publishing classified information on WikiLeaks. The Justice Department in 2019 argued that Assange's actions went beyond journalism and it risked serious harm to U.S. national security. It was sentenced to time already served. In Arizona this week, Border Patrol agents warned migrants of deadly situation near the U.S.-Mexico border. Agents say people can die making the trek to the U.S. due to extreme temperatures and rough terrain. The loss of life is not worth making this trek. Uh, because the, all of these smuggling organizations are lying to the, the migrants who are crossing because to them, they're just a commodity. They're just trying to make money off and, and extort these people. And so they're not telling them the dangers that they are going to be facing once they cross the border. The agents suggest that the reality migrants encounter on the journey is often very different from what they expect. He added that the Border Patrol wants to bring the message out so people don't lose their lives trying to come to the U.S. The agent also says the Border Patrol is trying to prevent illegal crossings altogether. But if people do cross are in trouble, agents are still prepared to help them. Two days after Title IX turned 52, Riley Gaines, Martina Navratilova, and several former athletes and coaches spoke in opposition of new changes to the law. 
Many said that the amendments are a backward progression from their original intention. NTD's Jason Blair has more from the event. Title IX was signed into law in 1972. It's intended to eliminate sex-based discrimination in schools that receive federal funds. It applies to a wide range of areas, including sports, admissions, and financial aid. Title IX was recently amended to include gender identity and sexual orientation. These changes go into effect August 1st. On Tuesday evening in Washington, D.C., former NCAA swimmer Paula Scanlon said the new changes are trying to equate sex to gender identity. Meaning, if you identify as a woman, anyone can identify as a woman, it makes you um, equivalent to being a female, which is just biologically not true. She said the changes won't just apply to sports, but also academic scholarships, bathrooms, locker rooms, and female-only dorms. Imagine sending your 17-year-old off to college and she gets a random roommate and you think it's going to be a female-only dorm, but you show up and her roommate is another 17-year-old boy. In March, President Joe Biden issued an executive order that tasked the Department of Education with amending Title IX. In the order, it stated, quote, It is the policy of my administration that all students should be guaranteed an educational environment free from discrimination on the basis of sex including discrimination in the form of sexual harassment, which encompasses sexual violence, and including discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity. Tennis legend Martina Navratilova said that women's sports and women's spaces must stay sex-based. We cannot have women's sports not be female. Riley Gaines, an NCAA swimmer who famously lost a trophy to a transgender competitor after tying at the 2022 National Championships, also spoke on Tuesday. It's transcended into, into prisons. We're seeing male inmates, inmates who are in prison, incarcerated for heinous crimes, sexual crimes, um, enter into women's facilities now. We're seeing how this is affecting sororities. During the tour's previous stop in North Carolina, their bus was egged and vandalized with pro-transgender graffiti. It was pretty severe. The marks are still on there, but, you know, they didn't, we didn't care. It just really fired everybody up and uh, just got everyone even more pumped to come to our next few stops. The Take Back Title IX tour has completed 11 of 13 planned stops. They say their aim is to raise awareness over the Title IX amendments that they say are, quote, stripping sex-based protections in education. Jason Blair, NTD News. Now on to a recap of primary results from some key states. Pro-Israel George Latimer has defeated Congressman Jamal Bowman in New York's congressional primary. And Lauren Boebert wins in Colorado as Jeff Hurd claims the nomination in her old district. Democratic voters in New York's 16th district chose to oust progressive Congressman Jamal Bowman as Israel's war in Gaza continues to divide the party. His opponent, former state legislator George Latimer, Latimer entered the contest with the support of Jewish leaders in the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, or APAC. APAC spent over $14 million in ads for Latimer's campaign. This makes it the most expensive house race ever, according to Ad Impact. In a speech after his projected victory, Latimer called for unity in the Democratic Party. We unify with each other because every one of us has some skill and ability that the other one of us does not have. Bowman, who is seeking a third term, has criticized Israel for its actions in Gaza and drawn considerable flack for it. On Tuesday night, he conceded defeat and thanked his supporters. I really appreciate you all being here. Thank you for all your love and support. He reiterated his commitment to the pro-Palestine movement. In Colorado, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert is projected to win the 4th District Republican primary. She switched from the 3rd to the 4th District to run for Ken Buck's open seat after he resigned in March. Boebert faced off against five Republicans, but held the top spot in fundraising and the endorsement of former President Trump. Her move from Colorado's 3rd to 4th District means she will avoid facing off against Democrat Adam Frisch again. In 2022, she edged Frisch out in one of the most hotly contested races that year. In Boebert's former district, Jeff Hurd is projected to finish safely ahead of former state representative Ron Hanks. Hanks found support from Democrats who saw him as a weaker candidate as they attempt to flip the 3rd district in November. 
Also in Colorado, Jeff Crank is projected to win the 5th District Republican primary. The latest count shows him handedly beating Trump-endorsed Dave Williams, who serves as a state GOP chair. Colorado's 5th District is solidly red. This means there's a good chance Crank will be elected in November. Another Trump-backed candidate is projected to lose in South Carolina. Mark Burns is set to lose a one-on-one -on -one runoff in South Carolina's 3rd District. His rival, Sherry Biggs, is now on track to face Democrat Byron Bess. The district is conservative, giving her the advantage. This Thursday, joining Steve Lance and Tiffany Meyer for analysis of the first presidential debate. Watch the first half of The Nation Decides at 8.30 p.m. Eastern tomorrow and our second half after the debate at 11 p.m. Eastern. The big night's almost here. The current and former president's debate to win your vote again. Watch the CNN presidential debate on CNN or simulcast here on NTD News. And catch our pre- and post-debate coverage on The Nation Decides 2024. First presidential debate with Steve Lance and Tiffany Meyer. Live tomorrow, 8.30 p.m. Eastern on NTD News. We'll take a short break now, everybody, but here's a look at what we have for you when we come back. After an FBI raid on one politician's home in Oakland, two people resigned from her team. Information on the raid is unclear, but the mayor denies any wrongdoing. The LA County half cent homelessness sales tax heads toward November ballot. 75 tons of illegal fireworks seized in the largest bust in California history. We have more details on the operation. Those stories and more are coming up on NTD Tonight. Welcome back to NTD Tonight. I'm your host, David Zhang. A big buzz in Oakland after FBI raided several properties, including the mayor's home, which she shares with her partner and son. There hasn't been official information, but several of the mayor's allies have resigned. NTD's David Lamb reports. Days after the FBI raided the home of Oakland Mayor Sheng Tao, she gave a news conference saying that she's not guilty and didn't do any wrongdoing. Here's what people in Oakland have to say. I was shocked at first, um, confused, a little disappointed as well. Yeah, um, our mayor has been having some troubles lately and um, I was concerned that this could be the last straw for her. Something's going on, whether it's her or her partner. Um, the FBI doesn't just raid your house for nothing. The reasons for the raid remains unclear, but there's reports alleging possible public corruption and the mayor's living partner could be a subject of interest. The FBI also raided the local recycling company and two other houses owned by the owners. I would like to see her say how she's cooperate, cooperating with the FBI, um, what her part is in this. I would really just like full disclosure. Um, I think that's probably the best course of action for her because um, the neighborhood wants to know. On Monday's press conference, Mayor Tao questioned how reporters quickly showed up early in the morning at the time of the FBI raid. Local reports say that her communications chief and lawyer resigned. I have done nothing wrong. I can tell you with confidence that this investigation is not about me. There's a recall initiative demanding the mayor to resign. What's the first thing the new mayor should do? The first thing I would like them do is to do is to show some ownership. I would speak for everyone and say crime is probably the biggest issue, right? Crime, um, which part of that is an economic issue, part of that is, you know, uh, we've gotten too soft <laughs> in terms of penalizing criminals. Um, and then, but, but you also have to have alternatives in terms of, you know, folks being able to make a living, an affordable living. This comes at a difficult time for the mayor as she's expected to face a recall vote in November. Reporting in Oakland, California, David Lamb, NTD News. The Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors unanimously agreed to allow voters to determine the possibility of increasing sales tax.
NTD's Christina Corona has more details on the measure. The proposal, titled the Affordable Housing Homelessness Solutions and Prevention Now Initiative by the Our Father Los Angeles Coalition, outlines a potential tax hike to finance a comprehensive program addressing homelessness and promoting affordable housing. Supporters of the measure reported submitting over 410,000 petition signatures, well above the required 238,922. The county clerk's office has certified enough valid signatures to qualify the measure for the ballot. This ballot measure will fund both homelessness services, replacing the critical measure H dollars, and fund housing production and prevention through the Los Angeles County Affordable Housing Solutions Agency and LACDA through a half cent sales tax. The measure would replace the current quarter cent sales tax, which funds the homelessness response system and will expire in 2027. Officials stated that the proposed sales tax hike would affect all but five cities in L.A. County, Compton, Linwood, Pico Rivera, Santa Monica, and Southgate, since these cities do not currently contribute to the Homeless and Housing Measure H Special Revenue Fund. Measure H, passed in 2017, supports supportive housing projects across the county, including the newly opened Wangart Tower, a 19-story development with 278 units for homeless individuals. County funding will help to support intensive case management services, which are critical to ensuring that residents stay permanently housed. At the Weingart Tower, which is located on Skid Row, the county is making an investment of $1.4 million in an annual investment to support the residents there. Measure H is also helping to support the county's relatively new Pathway Home Program, which is tackling the encampments and offering immediate access to interim housing for those people that are living on the streets. The board voted 4-0 to zero to submit the measure to the November 5th ballot. Christina Corona, NTD News. While most of the U.S. is struggling with the heat waves, other parts are battling floods. In Minnesota, an old dam looks like it's about to break, threatening the residents who live near it. In Blue Earth County, Minnesota, the Rapidan Dam, built over a century ago, is at risk of failing. Authorities say a buildup of tree debris clogged the dam during recent heavy rainfalls. And with nowhere else to go, the water from the Blue Earth River carved a new path on its west side. The water has put local resident Jenny Barnes' home at severe risk. It'll happen. I just, we don't know when, but it's going to be inevitable that the house is going to go. But the house is more than just the Barnes' family residence. That's our business. That's our livelihood. Um, you know, it's everything. The rushing floodwaters have already taken out other structures. We lost the Excel Energy power substation, as well as a large park storage building and uh, materials that were stored in there. Other residents with fond memories of the area also hope the dam remains intact. Me and my aunt, we used to like, go here all the time with my uncle, playing the playground in the middle. And I hope it doesn't like wash away, hopefully. Right now, officials are in a monitoring situation. We're just watching to make sure that uh, we're trying to do what we can to assess what debris is going into the, uh, the river, watch for any uh, effects that may have downstream, and of course keeping an eye on the uh, flow of the river and the volume and things like that. Jenny Barnes is hoping the river spares her family home and business. There's no stopping it. It's going to go where it wants to go. It's going to take what it wants to take. and. Everybody pray that it takes doesn't take the dam store. The local public works director says downstream residents have been advised of the imminent failure condition. No mass evacuations have been planned. However, people living along the river are watching closely and being asked to stay alert. Millions of dollars of worth of fireworks were seized from an illegal operation in Gardena, California, in one of the biggest of fireworks busts in state history. NTD's Christina Corona has more details on the story. 
the Gardena Police Department, CAL FIRE, and ATF conducted a single operation, resulting in the seizure of more than 75 tons of illegal fireworks, marking it as the largest single seizure in recent California history, surpassing the previous record set in 2021 when 32 tons of fireworks were seized in a South Los Angeles warehouse. Investigators located the fireworks at a commercial warehouse in the 17,000 block of Vermont Avenue on Friday. Officials discovered over 2,000 illegal destructive devices and 10 pounds of bulk homemade explosives. The estimated street value of these fireworks is approximately 7 to $10 million. Investigators have identified the three suspects as Alejandro Rodriguez, age 44, from Wilmington, Natalie Navarro, age 30, from Carson, and Daniel Gudino, age 25, also from Wilmington. They have been arrested and booked on suspicion of possession of explosives and other weapons violations. The Gardena Police Department Special Investigations Unit is in the initial stages of the investigation. Anyone with information on this case is urged to contact the Gardena Police Department. Christina Corona, NTD News. Stay tuned for China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer coming up next. Chips, ships, and drones. How are the tools shaping Beijing's arsenal for autocracy posing risks to the U.S.? A look at the House panel's latest findings on China's bid to dominate crucial industries. More on China in Focus with Tiffany Meyer at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And that's all we've got for you tonight. We'd like you to join us again on NTD Tonight every weekday at 9 p.m. I'm David Zhang. Have a wonderful evening.